In 2016, um, the Blackfeet Tribe, the, the um, MSU Extension Agent for the Blackfeet Tribe BIA, um, um, ha have worked together for a very long time to, to make sure that this plan has come into fruition. And so today is a great day because it, it, it underscores um, uh, the launching of the draft for the ARMP, something that we've been working on for the past uh, two plus years. And so um, in terms of a timeline, and I'll go over it in a minute, um, we have three years to complete our ARMP, and so our uh, deadline is June of next year. So we want to ensure that we've gone through the approval process by December of this year so that uh, in the event that anything comes up, it gives us a little bit of time to um, uh, remedy any last minute um, uh, concerns. And so um, I, um, I just want to start off by maybe turning out this one light so you can see in the back. Is that, is that easier to see for you, you folks in the back? Okay, good. So um, I always like to start off with a couple of quotes. Um, we've had the pleasure of traveling around um, a, a lot um, in terms of um, getting idea, an idea of agricultural resource management. But also in, in that uh, plight, we've also lined up dollars for us to implement our ARMP. So that means that we're looking at um, funding sources that, that help us underwrite the implementation of the goals and objectives for the Agricultural Resource Management Plan. And so I always like to start off with a couple of quotes, right? And the first one, and I'm sorry that I, that, you know, that I usually customize this for wherever I'm presenting it, but um, uh, the very first quote that, that was here <laughs> was from the um, uh, Executive Director of the Intertribal Agriculture Council. And what it said was that um, tribes will never afford true sovereignty without food sovereignty. So when we think about agricultural resource management planning and the ability to grow our own food and ensure that that makes it into our local food delivery system, we um, have the option here to really create a new market for our producers, and that's a, a market that would feed our own people, first and for foremost, right? That would be a market that allows us to get um, our, our black meat raised beef into the casino, into the grocery store, into the schools, into um, uh, all of the other food delivery systems. And so when we think about agricultural resource management, we need to be thinking about um, new markets that allow us to raise up our producers and invest in them and their production. Um, uh, unravel the jurisdictional complexities around trust land management that makes their uh, land more productive. So the first one is treat the earth well. I mean, the first one was the IAC, right? The second one is treat the earth well. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. And so that's a very profound statement that was, um, that was um, uh, and the quote comes from Crazy Horse. Uh, so when we think about that in, in that context, we have the opportunity to redefine commercial agriculture production here at Blackfeet and for the rest of the country. Most of our food delivery systems in this country are market driven, are profit driven. And as a result, they don't take into consideration health, they don't take into consideration uh, nutrition, they take into consideration profitability. And so when we think about that here at Blackfeet, we have the opportunity to be both profitable and provide uh, healthy, nutritious food that begins to narrow our health disparities. And so um, the, uh, the third one is, is a very profound um, quote, and that was, um, uh, I heard at a food sovereignty summit, and it was um, uh, from a native Hawaiian elder. And what she said was that um, when our hands are faced up, we will always be hungry, right? When our ha hands are faced down and we're working the earth, we will never be hungry. And so that speaks volumes on so many levels. Um, as black people in our history, you don't have to go too far back. We were never, ever dependent on anyone. We were always self-sufficient. Our entire history, we were always self-sufficient. We always provided for our families, whether that was through hunting and gathering, whatever that may be. And so we have a very long history of independence. And so we want to ensure that our agricultural resource management plan reflects that history, right? That we are promoting our people, we are empowering them to uh, be self-sufficient. Right, to, um, to be able to operate with one foot in a circle as we preserve our life ways, the practice of who we are as Blackfeet people, and one foot out as we embrace um, a, a Western technology, a Western way of life, right? Um, and so that's really a market-driven economy, right? And so, um, so those are the quotes, and so that's that. So let's move right along. 
for those of you that are joining us for the first time, and I just like to do this review, um, it's kind of hard to tell um, what we're dealing with uh, or the plants that we're creating if we don't understand the context of where we're at. So we are a part of the Blackfoot Confederacy, which means that we have three tribes on the north side of Alberta. That will become very important when we think about international trade, right, and the ability to create a trade umbrella that allows our producers to be more profitable. Um, and we're the only uh, tribe in the United States that, uh, that's a part of the Blackfoot Confederacy. So ideally, at the end of the day, we want to be able to move our goods back and forth across that border uh, without tariff. And, um, and not just our goods, but our cultural items as well. And so we've been uh, busy working on that as well. So we, um, we reside currently or presently on a million and a half acres. And so nestled with Glacier National Park on the west, Alberta, Canada on the north. Our traditional territory, which will be very important as we move on in this process as well, um, goes from the Continental Divide down, takes in half, half the Yellowstone National Park, goes along the Yellowstone River to the Dakotas, and then back across um, the, the 49th parallel. And so when we think about gaining access to traditional foods, medicinal plants, um, uh, hunting and fishing, we still have access to that in that entire area. So we want to start looking as we look at making more foods available to our people, um, uh, the ability to, to uh, for these public lands in that area to recognize a Blackfeet hunting license, a Blackfeet fishing license, um, a Blackfeet's right to gather in those areas. Um, we're afforded that through our treaty rights. And so we recently, so there's a couple things that kind of complicated our process, not really, uh, but it kind of complicated in a good way. And the first was the land buyback program, which um, um, uh, the tribe, uh, I believe, uh, acquired 324,404 acres, is that, is that right? Yeah, okay, um, 324,404 acres. Um, and then the other uh, thing that happened was last June, the Blackfeet people got together and, and, and passed the Blackfeet Water Compact, which have defined our allocation for water resources here at Blackfeet. And so those two things um, we had to take into consideration and fold into the development of the ARP so that we were ensuring that there was coordination between those and, um, and what that looks like on the ground, right? Agriculture production. So we are, uh, in terms of size, we're larger than the state of Delaware. We're twice the size of Rhode Island, except we don't have the two senators that come with those states and the congressmen, right? We have a nine-member tribal business council. And so when you think about uh, the uh, having to uh, manage the resources on the same amount of real estate, that's what we're comparable to. We're also about the same size as the island nation of Puerto Rico, <laughs> right about a million and a half acres. So we um, have 55% of the, the um, diversity that exists, in the um, biodiversity that exists in Montana. So that means that if you take your two fingers and you put them on a big Montana map, right, you know, our little million and a half acres represents more than 55% of the animal species and the planet species that exist in that 94 million acre area. We have 84, uh, I mean 80% of the vertebrates, we have um, a tremendous amount of biodiversity. So when we think about redefining production agriculture, we have the opportunity to also protect our biodiversity while affording sustainable economic development through commercial agriculture production. And so we really do have the chance to redefine from a Blackfeet lens what that means, and I'll cover that on the next slide. So we have um, five watersheds, 518 miles of streams, 180 uh, bodies of water, mostly prairie pothole wetlands, and um, uh, 51,582 acres of, wet, uh, of um, wetlands, and 175,000 acres of um, forest land. So in terms of a, um, a, a process, we can do everything under the sun, under the ARMP, with the exception of forestry. That's um, defined under the Integrated Resource Management Plan. And so I was asked, um, I was um, uh, invited back in April, and a few members of our team, along with myself and, and Christopher Carter, um, uh, presented to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. And so uh, while we were there, they asked us um, uh, how we utilize, because we were the only presentation that made correlations to the UN framework, they asked us how we utilize the, re uh, the UN framework to inform what it was that we were doing here at Blackfeet. And, and so that was the first question that, that I was asked um, after we presented there. And so the very first thing that I said was if I use the UN framework in Blackfeet country, 
I would be laughed right off the reservation, right? They'd tell me, you can go work in Crow, you can go work in Fort Belknap, but you can't work here at Blackfeet, because here at Blackfeet, we have to think about Blackfeet ways of knowing, Blackfeet ways of being, and Blackfeet ways of planning. So that means that we're utilizing our critical, uh, I mean, our, our, um, our um, uh, core values to inform policy development across the board, right? So that means that we're looking at um, uh, uh, life ways, right, how we can utilize that to inform uh, modern day management concepts, right? So um, our authority, we derive our authority from Public Law 10377, which, which is the American Indian Agricultural Resource Management Act of 1993. And so when we, were, when we looked at the legislation, what we discovered through these requirements was that a tribe has great latitude to develop a plan that is conducive to their needs, that allows them to make correlations, especially when you consider um, uh, holistic management objectives, correlations to everything else, right? So that means that in a larger system, we're looking at interdependent relationships and functions and, and taking those under consideration when we think about um, resource management planning, right? And so uh, what the ARP says, and the reason that the ARP at IARMA, right? IARMA, is that how you say it? <laughs> the American Indian uh, uh, Re um, Agricultural Resource Management Act of 1993. Uh, the reason it came about was really to unravel the jurisdictional complexities around trust land management um, uh, so that our, our producers and our landowners could be more productive. And here we are 25 years later and we're still dealing with those same challenges when it comes to um, uh, a navigating process of, uh, through trust land management functions. So at the very end of the day, um, we have the opportunity to really look at um, many approaches that would allow us to begin to unravel those jurisdictional complexities around trust fund management. So when you think about it from a simplistic way, if I want to farm just on the other side of the reservation, right, right down by cut bank, right, I can do this, 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 and this, and do it in this timeline, right, you know, but if I'm dealing with um, trust land, then I have this much more regulation, right, that requires all of these things, right, just to grow potatoes or to run cattle. Right, so what we need to be thinking about as governments is how we put our heads together to unravel those jurisdictional complexities that allows cattle producers to be more productive, that allows um, uh, uh, people to gain access or right away in, in a very quick, efficient manner, that allow us to appraise our land in an efficient manner. So when we think about trust land management functions, that was the foundation for the creation of the Agricultural Resource Management Act of 1993. So through the ARMP process, we have the opportunity to actually unravel those jurisdictional complexities, be in a position to make recommendations to Congress to uh, simplify those processes and make it much more easy for our people to, to grow whatever they want to on the land. We're at the headwaters, right? We have the cleanest water, we have the cleanest grass, we have the cleanest production of anything that you grow, whether that be plant or animal. Um, so it's our job to be thinking about how we market those products, right? Right now we get market value for them, we could be getting niche value for them just because of our landscape, right? So when we think about access to those higher markets, we want to ensure that we're creating the policies that allow our um, uh, producers here at Blackfeet to be much more productive and much more profitable, right? So at the end of the day, we want to ensure that, that, uh, that private production is leading the expansion of the Blackfeet um, economy and building a middle class, right? So the, the Agricultural Resource Management um, Act uh, requires that you um, have these in your plan, right? So there's determine uh, available agricultural resources, identify specific tribal agriculture resource goals and objectives, establish the objectives for those resources, define critical values of the Indian tribe and its members, and provide identified holistic management objectives. And I'll cover that in a minute. Um, identify actions to be taken to reach established objectives, be developed through public meetings. Every one of our meetings are open to the public, and that's a statutory requirement. Uh, use those public meeting records, existing survey documents, reports, and other research from federal agencies, tribal community colleges, and land grant universities, and be completed within three years from the time that you start. So that means that we have through uh, until June to really complete everything. We want to be done by December, right? We want to be done a little bit early, so in the event that we need to, to uh, make any last minute changes or whatever that may be. So that's what gives us a, uh, our authority, right? 
to, to do what uh, we want to, me to do. And I apologize, this is an old council photo, right? We um, haven't received a new one yet. I don't think that they've taken the time to sit down and, and do a photograph yet. And so meantime, um, we'll just pretend like that, that, and, and that, right, are three new people, okay? And so, um, <clears throat> So when I first started this job, I, oh, and that one too, right? So when I first started this job, I, um, I stood before the Blackfeet Tribal Business Council and I said, what role do you want to play in policy development, in agriculture resource management planning, right? What role do you want to play? Do you want to um, uh, invest in the private sector, right, where we're, where we're creating the policies that allow private production to thrive? Or do you want to create a lot of government-owned um, enterprises, which would be the public sector approach, right? And so they resoundingly said, we want to invest in the private sector. We want to ensure that what, what we're doing isn't competing against the private sector. What we're doing is empowering our private sector to lead the way to create a middle class in our Blackfeet economy. And so, um, so, so that's the difference between um, uh, creating tribal enterprises that create entry level uh, employment, right, which even TANF has a hard time competing with, right, because someone with two kids, you know, with health care, with everything, with child care, with everything else, with rent, right, you know, can't really um, uh, make it on $9 an hour, right? So then you end up end up um, uh, competing with the welfare system just to, to um, fill your vacancies for your entry-level positions. Or do you want to allow the private sector to lead that charge, right? You know, that means small business development, all of those other things, which I'll cover in a minute. And so they said resoundingly, we want to invest in the, in the public, in the private sector to um, create that growth in our economy. Um, so that means that we want to create a mechanism that allows uh, a new markets, right? Emerging new markets, which means that our, uh, our uh, producers become suppliers for our local food delivery systems in addition to international export opportunities, right? And so they also said we want to uh, uh, narrow our health disparities of our people. Black people die. 20 years younger than our non-native counterparts. 20 years, that's egregious, right? 20 years younger. And so if we're not thinking about the food that we grow and how we uh, get that back into our local food delivery system, then we're just not thinking, right? So that means also the reintroduction of traditional foods into our diets, right? Buffalo, wild game, berries, other foods. Um, and there's another part to that that I'm not gonna go into too much um, on the health and nutrition side, and I will when I go through our funding sources. Excuse me. And then the third thing that was resounding that should be on all of our minds, right, is how we infuse uh, institutional knowledge into our younger people, right? We absolutely have to invest in our young people to create sustainability here at Blackfeet. The average age of farmers and ranchers in 1980 for Montana was 50. Today it's 65. So if we're not thinking about how we raise that median household income and lower that median age for farmers and ranchers, then we're not gonna have anything sustainable. So that means that everything that we do has a youth component so that, um, so that our young people can learn what it is that we're doing, learn the craft, learn the trade from all facets, right? So when you think about right from the beginning of production all the way to food on the table, we want to ensure that we're um, teaching our young people every one of those functions so that if they choose to stay here in Blackfeet country, make a living here in Blackfeet country, that they um, are, are making a, 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 a living wage to, to live and stay here, to raise a family. And so, uh, so that means that we want to invest in youth programs, uh, the current ones, 4-H, high school, middle school, BCC, agriculture programs. But we also want to expand those programs and uh, look at the possibility for new programs that help us infuse that institutional knowledge.